Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. November 27th, 2024. Let's get into it. Happy day before Thanksgiving. Of course, by the time you watch this, it'll probably be, well, maybe not Thanksgiving Day. If hopefully you're eating turkey, maybe drinking some beverages and uh, having a good time, being with family and friends. Yeah, I was one thing a woman called in on Sean Hannity and I was like, wow, there's somebody else like me. She, Because I have no family and uh, very few friends. And uh, I, in fact, nobody I, that I'll be spending Thanksgiving with. Now, I might go to the VFW. Don't be feeling sorry for me. I'm just saying, you be thankful for what you have. You know, if you've got that family and friends. You know, I, I alienated all my, my Democrat friends back during the, the jab. Because I was trying to tell people what was going on. Especially with the experimental uh, uh, COOF uh, jab. Uh, because, you know, I had the anthrax vaccine when I was over in uh, Kuwait, and uh, it about killed me. And so I knew there was no way I was going to take another experimental vaccine where I couldn't uh, sue the uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, that's a law that needs to, that RFK hopefully will turn over. You know, if you get injured from a, from a, um, a jab, you know, that you should be able to seek legal recourse. And unfortunately, you can't. Plus, I knew the way that they were advertising it. And then when they put the mandate on, something was wrong there. That was all about the, the big, big farmer making money. No doubt about it. Anyway, I want to start the video with some topics that you might want to hit with your Democrat or your liberal friends over that Thanksgiving table. Oh no, well the reason why I'm doing this is because Sean Hannity just had a show on where he, uh, he had people calling in to talk about how they were gonna handle their Democrat or liberal friends over the uh, Thanksgiving Day table. <laughs> it, was, it was real interesting. Some of the people were going to poke them in the eye. Other people were going to just... One woman called in and she goes, You know, I just hate uh, controversy. We're just... We all get along. We just avoid those topics. Well, that's why we're in the problem that we're in. And we're going to get to talking about some of these problems. I mean, we're in a real mess in this country. And the reason is, is because there's no honest debate. There's no discussion. I understand, you know, if you got Democrat friends, you, you want to keep those friends. Unfortunately, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want all my friends to, to my Democrat friends to, to divorce me. That's just their choice, not mine. Now, I kind of went off on the deep end with, because I was sending out updates and emails, and they just didn't want to know the truth. They couldn't stand the truth, and so they just shut me out. A lot of them blocked me, told me not to call them no more, you know, and, which was fine. I mean, you know, I... I, I took no uh, chagrin to it. I was just shocked that they, uh, you know, they just wanted to stick their head in the sand and believe whatever the government was telling them. That's who a Democrat is. Anyway, so here's, here's one for you. I, this is a recent, recent reply. Tell me if you think the words describe the Biden administration. A genocide in Gaza, thousands did in Lebanon, a million did in Ukraine, no remorse. And this is what I think of the people in Congress. Now, this is not true of all Democrats, okay? All Democrats are not evil. I, we've not talked about the three types of Democrats, obviously. But I'm just gonna tell you, the people that are running the government right now, they're evil. And you say, oh, that cybersecurity guy, there's rhinos up there too. Yeah, Mitch McConnell's evil, okay? Most definitely, Tom Cotton is evil, all right? This guy Throom, I don't know, he, he's looking like an evil son of a gun. But I want to read to you what an evil person is. All right? And this is where I, where I classify a lot of the Democrats in government. You know, think of uh, that woman in charge of New York. What is her name? Hochul. Yeah, Hochul. She's evil. You know, uh, the, the uh, California. Uh, anyway. All right. Evil is a completely different creature. Evil believes bad is okay. Its actions are justified. And violence is divorced from conscience. I want you to consider that statement. The violence is divorced from conscience. Oh, God dang it. You'd think with all the cold weather there wouldn't be any mosquitoes. Sorry, and buzzing me. Got to keep them away. You know, if you don't know how mosquitoes work, the male comes in and makes a lot of noise. And then it brings the females to you so they can bite on you. So if you don't wave that male away, you're going to get bit. <clears throat> all right. So, but evil people, they have no conscience. You know, a million dead. Take a Lindsey Graham. That's an evil son of a bitch. Uh, you know, he goes on, he says, you know, we just got to keep, keep things going in Ukraine, you know, because they got a trillion dollars in natural resources for BlackRock to go in 
and uh, and gobble up because BlackRock's already bought all that Ukraine land. That's an evil statement. That means he doesn't care about a million dead people, and just says it flippantly. All right, so I, that's and that's a, that means he has no conscience, no no moral compass whatsoever. These people are deranged. They're psychopaths. So let's just keep going. No matter what toll it takes or who it takes it upon. So think about it. We killed a million people in Iraq. These people, there's no conscience, no, no thought, no, uh, no anything. So, but I want to get back, you know, because people are questioning. You say you call, keep calling it a genocide in Gaza. So we're going to start the video here. We're going to focus on Israel for just a minute. All right. The first thing is, it was pointed out to me that on Hamas's website, they're saying there's only uh, 44,000 uh, dead Palestinians. Now think about that, 44,000 dead, but God knows how many casualties there are, okay? And then how many uh, people are starving to death or are going to die, okay? And I did read recently, now that the ceasefire has taken place with Lebanon, uh, that Hamas is asking for peace. But I want you to, that got it, mosquitoes coming at me again. I want you to think about what, uh, what Israel did just before the ceasefire. This is Israel bombing Beirut 30 minutes before the ceasefire took place. Let's watch that video. Another scene of destruction here in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. This is the latest Israeli strike in a busy civilian neighborhood. The uh, attack occurred at around 3 o'clock local time. Israel struck without warning. Now you can see a building behind us, an apartment block, uh, has been completely flattened, completely destroyed. As we understand, this was a kitchen which was making food for displaced people. Now uh, we've seen ambulances arriving and leaving the scene uh, for the past few hours, taking away those that were wounded in the attack. We know that there are multiple casualties at this stage. We've seen uh, an elderly man being taken from the rubble, being treated by those emergency services. This was, again, another attack right in the heart of the Lebanese capital. Earlier, we, heard, we saw the bombing of the Dahia district in the southern suburbs of Beirut, multiple strikes there, and then yet again Again, at the same time that Israel struck the Basta district, it uh, launched simultaneous strikes in the Dahia district, blast after blast after blast, very, very close together. The uh, Israelis effectively carpet bombed the southern suburbs of the Lebanese capital. Just making a quick getaway from uh, the scene. We've just heard an evacuation order. The uh, Israelis are now going to be targeting Al Qaeda Al Hassan, which is a financial institution. Of course, this institution itself has already been targeted with large strikes across the Lebanese capital, Beirut. We're now making our way uh, to a place of safety. <laughs> We're now stuck in uh, traffic. We're in Manara in central Beirut. This is, uh, as you can see, this is, a, again, a densely populated civilian area. We've been stuck in traffic now for, I guess, more than an hour. Uh, the roads are gridlocked. People are trying to make their way to places of safety. Israel has issued uh, at least four evacuation orders in central Beirut. So this is outside of the normal target area. Um, it's, it's actually hard now to keep up with the number of evacuation orders that Israel is issuing. Um, this is a, another day of terror. That's the only way we can really describe it. People are desperately trying to make their way to places of safety. They're using car. People are leaving on, on foot as well. Um, this is the most intense day of bombing, certainly since the escalation at the end of uh, September that Israel is trying to cause mass destruction, um, maximum carnage before any ceasefire comes into agreement, if indeed it does so now. The huge numbers of uh, civilians killed, um, huge casualty numbers that we're seeing. More than 3,700 people have been killed now since October the 8th last year. That's according to the Lebanese Health Ministry. The majority of those in the past six or seven weeks. So where we go from here and what happens next is now very much in, up in the air.
Okay, so that's that. So then I was searching out, okay, these numbers seem awful low. And if I could find the numbers in the Lancet, because I thought they were a lot higher, that's a British medical journal, used to be reputable. What they were, when they reported on the COVID uh, or the, uh, the virus or the cough, excuse me, uh, they lied. They lied about everything. So they lost all credibility there. And he was goes, well, that's British, man. You can't trust anything out of Britain. <laughs> you know, the comments and everything. I said, well, you know, okay, you, you kind of got a good point there, you know. But uh, anyway, let's, let's watch uh, Lavrov confirm those numbers. I found this video. Human casualties over, over one year of Israel's operation in Palestine. I mean, Palestinian casualties among elderly people, children, women. The number of those casualties is somewhere around 45,000 people, which is almost double the number of civilian casualties on both sides in Ukraine over the decade since the 2014 coup. I think this alone shows very well what's going on in Palestine. And this general paragraph also says that, that it is inadmissible to strike against civilian objects in Gaza Strip, tens of hospitals, tens of residential buildings are being attacked and targeted on a daily basis. All this is shown in social media and the West still undermines this strong call for to stop violence. And civilian infrastructure also includes the Nord Stream gas pipelines, and I think this will help us in our practical work that we carry on seeking a transparent investigation, something that only Germany has been doing so far. All right, so that's Lavrov on the... Uh, on that, so so when your when your relatives are sitting across the table from the Democrats, and they're going on, you know about, oh, how, you know how Democrats are okay, and you know I, you know I just uh, I just vote for whoever the Democrat Party tells me to, you know I want you to think about those things. Uh, let's see, I think I have another video. Uh, this is uh, you know a lot of Democrats don't understand who the Republican Party is, so this would be another thing that you could discuss at the kitchen table. You understand the Democrats are the party of Jim Crow. They're the party of slavery. They're the party that got rid of sound money. We're gonna talk about that in this video too. You know, back in uh, 1913, Woodrow Wilson brought in the Federal Reserve. Ooh, we love the Federal Reserve, don't we? Yeah, they, they, they have destroyed the United States and they've destroyed the dollar. But we're not gonna talk about that right now. I'm trying to get onto topics that you could talk to Democrats about across the table. Let's watch this black guy talking about the Republican Party. Now, for as long as I can remember, I have had the belief that the Republicans were the racists and the Democrats were the party for black folks. Of course, this was a byproduct of my own conditioning and essentially brainwashing from the mass media machine. Now, I want you guys to check this out. And I believe this may very well be the most important message that you hear, not because I'm in it, but because these facts cannot be ignored. This is what the left-wing propaganda machine that Google has turned into still cannot hide. If you type in the Republican Party, this is the very first thing that's going to pop up. And what does it say? The Republican Party was founded in 1854 by anti-slave activists. Let me read that one more time. In 1854 by anti-slave activists who opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which allowed for the potential extension of slavery to the Western territories. This right here is the original Republican Party home. This is their foundation. This is HQ right here. These are the headquarters. I want to visit this at one point in my life. These are the individuals who are standing behind this movement. Now, again, most of us, even to this modern day, are told that the Republicans or the conservatives are the racist party. And I'm not going to say that there have never been those who have superiority complexes, those who are bigoted, those who are ignorant, and those who are downright racist. But the reality is that the Cool Kids Club, the K, the K, and the other K, those individuals 
were a conception of the Democratic Party. And that stemmed back to Jim Crow laws, Democratic Party legislation, which came from another Democratic stronghold, slavery. Can't make this stuff up, folks. Can't make it up. So if they're willing to lie to you about this, for anybody who's on the left or in the middle somewhere, if they're willing to lie to you about something as foundational as this, what else are they going to lie to you about? Okay, so he brings out a good point. A lot of Democrats don't even know that Jim, they, they, uh, you know who the KKK were? And Robert Byrd, who Biden uh, did his eulogy at his, at his funeral, and the Democrats voted for him. He was the leader of the KKK. I mean, not the leader, but he was a huge supporter, you know. And, and so blacks just love getting beat up by the KKK because they keep voting for it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just blows my mind. Or Democrats do. I don't know. These white liberals don't seem to know their history very well, do they? Oh, my God. So we watched. Uh, oh, this was another one. I thought this was a really good one. This was a meme. I, I'm not going to put the meme up. It's just text. But it says, I wish Democrats hated sex offenders as much as they hate gun owners. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. We got 300,000 kids that are in brothels all across the United States because Democrats want it. They're pedophiles. They're freaks, man. What the hell? Why would you want kids getting raped all over the United States? That's the first thing that borders are Tom Honan, Tom Ho Horman. Yeah, Tom Horman. He said that's the first thing he's going to deal with is finding all these kids and getting them out of these brothels. God knows how many of them are dead. Democrats are all for that. Maybe bring that up. And, and why are they against guns? We've talked about that in the past, but I love that statement. I'm going to read it to you one more time. I wish Democrats hated sex offenders as much as they hate gun owners. <laughs> I, just, I just thought that was, that was hilarious. All right, so uh, that was a, the first thing I wanted to get into. And then we're going to do a reading later on from Zlat71, where he's, uh, he's talking about Democrats or psychopaths. So it's not just me that holds this opinion. Okay, there are others. So when we get into that portion of the video, maybe listen to what some other people are saying. You can say, well, he's a cybersecurity guy. Just because a couple other people are saying the same thing doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it untrue, does it? All right. So, uh, you know, you do your own homework. All right. So we're going to get into the uh, Russia, Ukraine. Got to talk about that for a minute. I was watching. Sorry, man. I think he, he bit me behind my ear. Damn it. Trying to get, keep him off. Hard to do when you're holding the, the uh, camera right here and uh, at the same time reading with the other hand. Uh, I don't even know how Alex on the Duran does it. He makes everything look so smooth, although he's got a gimbal, which by the way, I did look into gimbals. There's just not any really good ones for Android phones. They're all good for iPhones. So I imagine that, it, and I wish Alex someday would, would reveal it in his videos, uh, you know, Alex Kristoff, uh, you know, what, he's, what, he, what, what technology he's using. I do have the same mics as him, I do know that. Uh, so at least I've, I've got that out because he is the king of walking videos. Everything is smooth on his videos, unlike mine. So uh, anyway, so let's get to the Russian war. So I'm watching this Russian guy, or he's, he's actually out of Georgia. He was born in Georgia, but you know, of course, he speaks and translates fluent Russian to English. And what I liked was he was reading from the Russian newspapers all the latest news, and I was just up till I don't know, I was up till like three in the morning. You got to remember. If you really want to get the break in Russian news, that's coming across because they're on the other side of the world. You know, it's daytime there. It's the next day when you're sitting here in the morning here. And so I got all the latest uh, scoop for you. And uh, boy, the Russian headlines, they're all over. They're all over the fact that NATO is uh, talking about doing a preemptive strike on Russia. The other thing that he was uh, certain about, uh, and from the headlines, is that this latest strike with two attackums? By the way, I did want to speculate on that for just a minute. I'm not so sure that they thought. I, I don't think. I think the orders had already been given for those two attackums to get launched after the, the four that you know Russia responded to. If, if you don't know what happened, I think it was the 25th. We launched attackums. I don't know how many. Somebody say 10 into uh, into Russia along with some store shadow, I believe. And, uh, and, and it wasn't all in Kirsch. It was some areas uh, outside of Kirsch. I think I can't remember the, the area if I can get it up above. And uh, 
And so the Russians responded by sending the, the hazelnut. <laughs> I just got to laugh about that. Can you imagine naming a missile? Of course, it's the Ereshnik. Ereshnik, I think, is the Russian pronunciation for that or something like that. But, I mean, it's, it actually translates to hazelnut. You think about what we name our, our stuff. Storm Shadow. Attack them. Scalp. You know, you know, I mean, it, you know, it's always uh, these... You know, the Western names, you know, we always put, you know, evil names on them. You know, they're, they're destructive. And the, and the Russians name the most destructive missile known to mankind, conventional that I know of, they name it hazelnut. <laughs> and, and the reason, if you haven't watched other videos, is it comes down and the hazelnuts, you know, they hang down like a little thread like that. And, uh, you know, it, and so that's why they named it hazelnut, because they said it looks like when it strikes its target, it looks like a hazelnut. <laughs> I mean, I just think, I don't know. I, I, could you, death and destruction, getting the name hazelnut just seems kind of weird to me. Uh, but I wanted to read uh, why the Russians think that we're hidden into it. There's this guy... Uh, I think he's a Dutch, but anyway, he's high up in NATO, and uh, maybe out of the Netherlands. Can't remember Bauer. I just put his name Bauer on here, and uh, he says NATO is considering launching preemptive strikes on Russia, and he says prepare for a wartime scenario. Those are his exact words: prepare for a wartime scenario. Now the Russians are taking that very seriously. They're on high alert because they think that. Uh, the NATO is going to launch a preemptive strike. And then there's been other NATO officials that have come out and said similar things. And then you've got that idiot, Sebastian Gorka, who came out. And, and I don't know why Trump, Trump needs to, yeah, they, get, they bit me good. I got a bump right there. Trump needs to come out and, and say, you know, that Gorka's statement was, was off the mark. Because Gorka basically said that when Trump gets in, we're not only going to continue with the, 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 the evil Democrat policies, we're going to double down. We're going to send more money to Ukraine. We're going to send more weapons to Ukraine. We're going to send every freaking weapon in the entire United States arsenal to Ukraine. We're going to support Britain. And I mean, I'm just, I'm exaggerating here, of course, but that's more or less what he's, what he's implying to the Russians. So they're seeing this sea change with the Trump administration, which we all thought he ran on peace. They're seeing the sea change as, no, there's going to be no change in policy. It's just going to be a continuous... In fact, it's going to be even worse under the Trump administration. And there's been other people in the Trump administration that have come out. I mean, look at that psychopath Tom Cotton. That's the biggest warmonger I've ever seen in my life. Now, you, okay, so th this is another thing, all right? Because your Democrat friends, when they're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, they're going to come across from you. Well, there are bad Republicans, too. You know, Mitch McConnell. By the way, I'm Mitch McConnell. I want to talk about him for just a minute. He, uh, he came out and made, I, see, sometimes evil reveals itself, okay? And I think it's, uh, it's written in the Bible somewhere that evil must reveal itself uh, to, in order to commit the atrocities that they do. So you always kind of know what they're planning. It's just a lot of good people don't, uh, don't understand that. Let's, well, let's talk about the classifications of people. You got people that are just good. You know, you ever been around somebody? Now, when I say a good person, I'm not talking about that church going woman that brings in all the food and everything and then as soon as you you want to talk about something important like uh you know you know did you see what happened in russia and she goes oh no that's politics i can't i can't talk about that that's not a good person a good person is a good united states citizen you have to stay abreast of what's going on for your own good okay and for the good of the world you have to stay abreast so you can be intelligent about where you're casting your vote. You gotta be a good citizen. You gotta get out and do community service. Just baking for your Sunday church service doesn't make you a good person, okay? And then there are some bad people that are trying to be good. That would be me, okay? I was a pretty, uh, I was a juvenile delinquent. I was a bad person. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I look back, and that's one of the things that I do at night, is as soon as I start recalling a memory in my brain when I'm trying to go to sleep. I say, don't look back, just look forward. Don't ever look back. So I try not to look back. And I'm getting, I'm getting pretty good at it, you know, because I can wash out those thoughts pretty damn good. So I'm a bad person trying to be good, okay? Then you've got the corrupt people, and they're just bad. But they're not evil. They're just corrupt. They're, they're grifters. You know, that would be the, the, 
Well, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I look at Nancy Pelosi as evil. <laughs> but, uh, but she's an obvious example of a grifter, you know. There are some grifters out there. And they're corrupt, obviously. But they're not, uh, they're not completely evil. They're not some of them aren't completely devoid of conscience. You know, that statement, again, I, I keep beating on it. Oh, man. Turn my, my, my quote into a different language. <laughs> well, never mind. That's what happens when you stick your, your, uh, your uh, X post in your pocket. Uh, but anyway, what I was saying is, you know, evil is devoid of conscience. They don't care what the consequences are to other people. Grifters might care a little bit. Obviously, they're hurting people, but sometimes they're justified in the brain. Uh, and, and so then, of course, you got evil people, and we talked about that. So let's... Uh, Let's keep going on Russia for just a minute. We've talked about Gorka. Oh, by the way, we'll be reading. Max Blumenthal says that Gorka is a, uh, is a British agent. And uh, he's been t talking about a lot of that. And uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to read some posts here to you before it gets too dark in just a minute. Uh, and then, of course, uh, here's another video for you out of, out of Gaza. It's just a brief 10 second. This is some children collecting water. Imagine if this was in your neighborhood. Let's watch that. Okay, so that was just a little 10 second video on that. Uh, but yeah, we've, and then of course I'm gonna read a, do a reading from Zlat71 where he was talking about Democrat psychopaths. So, all right, let's get on to some other topics. We've talked about Ukraine. We've talked about Israel. Uh, I've addressed the comment that said, there's only 45,000 dead people in Gaza, mostly women and children, by the way. Oh yeah, that's justified, all right. That's not a, and by the way, you understand that the World Criminal Court convicted Netanyahu and uh, his counterpart, dang it, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, of, uh, of genocide so the whole world feels that way for the most part and then and, you know, the other thing that worries me about the getting staying on the Middle East for just a minute is the Trump administration he's putting so many hawks in there that want war with Iran how in the hell are you gonna fight a war with Iran Iran just turned back an Israeli strike sorry the mosquitoes are biting on me the uh, how are they gonna turn back a strike on uh, on uh, Iran I mean they turned back the Israeli strike on Iran so how the hell are you going to bomb Iran unless you use nukes? I mean, you could hit them with some, some missiles, some cruise missiles and stuff, but then Iran's got the same weaponry. Those military bases in the Middle East are going to go up in flames. All those F-35s, if we fly them into Iran, they're going to get shot down. Iran has the S-400, the best uh, defense system, air defense system in the world. So I, I don't see how, you know, and I know uh, Trump... He said he wants to attack Iran. He, he certainly, I, and how are you going to sanction Iran any more than they're already sanctioned? They don't do any business with the West. All their business is with China, which is another thing. Okay, you attack Iran, China gets uh, uh, the majority of their oil from Iran. And th this would be devastating to the Chinese economy if you took out the oil stuff. You think China's going to put up with that? Hell no. And then you might just drag, drag Russia into the conflict. Well, they already have because they've got a defense pact that they're going to be signing very soon. So, you know, I, that's what worries me about the Trump administration. They haven't come out with a statement saying they want peace with Russia. They haven't come out with a statement saying, you know, they want to, to continue. Well, at least we got a ceasefire right now. And I showed you how much the Israelis think of that ceasefire. By the way, Hamas, I think I already said it, but Hamas is suing for peace talks. So let's keep going. Uh, uh, let's see, let's get into uh, the next topic was, uh, all right, I, I, one of the things we, I've talked about finances, the dollar and everything else. Now, you have to understand the dollar was worth a dollar back in 1913. Then uh, the dollar was worth, um, you know, like, well, one dollar would buy an ounce of gold. Okay, let's just put it that way. That was, that was the original. So then it became, I want to say, well, maybe it wasn't a dollar. Well, anyway, I can't remember the numbers. But anyway, then it became $20. Then it became, uh, after uh, FDR, with the New Deal, and he spent just a, I don't know, in, in trivial terms, when you think about we're spending trillions every 100, a trillion every 100 days, back then he spent 500 billion, and gold went from 20 to $35. 
Then in the 70s, gold went up to, oh, let's say $500. It's at $2,500. So you see how your dollar, I think that's a good example of how your dollar is devaluing. Now, why am I talking about all of this? Because there's nothing, you know, we've got Doge, the Department of Government Efficiency coming in, and I, they think they can turn the ship around. It's not, it's not possible. It's mathematically impossible. The dollar is going to zero one way or another, and it's happening a lot faster than, well, I mean, if you're going to buy your groceries, you're seeing how fast it's happening right now. It's going to get a lot faster. So your dollars, if you've just got dollars parked in the bank, earning 2%, or 1% or whatever you're earning, you, you've got to think about where you're gonna put those dollars. I, I mean, silver's still a good purchase. Just throwing that out there. I mean, gold's just so sky, and by palladium and, plate, pal, palladium and platinum, I think are also a good place. So you might wanna throw, throw a few dollars in there. All right, because they'll at least hold their value. That's the thing, because the dollar's going to zero. So that means, and I'm gonna say, within the next two years, we'll see hyperinflation. Because there's nothing, there's, there's no amount of cutting you can do that can turn this ship around. The Titanic has struck the iceberg and we're going down. All right, so I just wanted you to prepare for that. And, and also you can prepare, and I've talked about this in other videos. We got a plane going over making some noise. You know, I've talked about this in other videos. Assets are not necessarily just uh, gold, silver, uh, real estate. I think about real estate. You know, back in my parents' day, they bought a, a house for $65,000. I mean, it had, it had almost uh, three quarters of an acre of land in, in the perfect place of the city. That house sold for $310,000. That's not because the house increased in value. That's because the dollar devalued. Okay, that's why your real estate price, that's why kids right now are earning $50,000. They can't buy a house because your salaries haven't really gone up that much. My parents were earning more than that. I, I want to say they were earning 100000 That was back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Okay? And, you know, I remember when I finally quit, I was earning 100000 but my dollar was worth a hell of a lot less than my parents' dollar. So it made it tough for me to get into a house. All right. So, anyway, so I just wanted to talk about the finances for just a minute. And then we'll get into... Uh, <clears throat> So there's a post, uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to it. We're gonna start doing, we'll do the reading. And the other thing was, uh, I wanted to just put this, we'll put this post up right now. It says, uh, Fox News on DEI. Walmart, Ford, John Deere, Toyota, and other manufacturers are getting rid of DEI. So the ship is turning around. We're getting there. The next portion of the video will be the reading. And maybe I've got some other uh, clips that I can throw up. And you know, I always have, one at the end, and uh, we'll, we'll put something there. All right, let's get to the reading. All right, let's get through the posts. So the first one here, uh, by the way, <laughs> I swear I keep thinking of things that make the videos, like I said, I looked into the gimbals, make the videos a little bit better, but the one that I came out, see this uh, mic? Testing, testing. Anyway, it, it latches on to my, uh, my stand because it's metal and I couldn't wrap electrical tape because you have to fold it out and fold it in. But then I thought if I just ran the tape along the edge, so I gotta do that, and that, that'll, that'll keep it from tick, glabbed on there. Another thing for you to discuss, the Thanksgiving Day table. DC Dranko, I am once again confirming that just because we won this election doesn't mean we have fully trust the results. We want forensic audits in every state, why? Because Democrats still cheated and we have to expose it. We just happened to make it too big to rig. And that was what I sent to Musk. And that was, that was one of the few replies that he actually gave a thumbs up to, which, you know, coming from a billionaire, millionaire, or trillionaire, whatever you want to call him, uh, I, I felt pretty good about that. And, uh, but yeah, I asked Democrats why they don't want voter ID. Oh, because the blacks can't get an ID. Well, the Hispanics can't. Do, do you know a single black person doesn't have an ID? Why don't you ask them that at the Thanksgiving Day table? Hey, you stupid liberal. Do you know a single person that doesn't have an ID? I don't, <laughs> I don't. Well, maybe a little baby, you know. Uh, even they have a birth certificate. All right, so this is, uh, this is more on Israel because I, I had to hit that theme because of the comment about the, uh, the genocide, you know, because I keep calling it a genocide and I'm gonna keep calling it that. So this is Scott Ritter. 
Israel can never be forgiven for the crimes it committed against the Lebanese people. And we watched that video on Beirut earlier. This ceasefire is simply a reprieve for the justice that will eventually be delivered to the illegal apartheid Zionist entity. Boy, I tell you, Scott holds nothing back, does he? <laughs> I mean, my God. I don't know. I'm pretty harsh, but Scott's worse, you have to admit. I mean, this is why a lot of people really don't like Scott Ritter. I don't know why. I love the guy. I think he's great. In the end, Israel has been, is, and always will be its own worst enemy. To defeat Israel, just let it exist. It will soon collapse from the decay of its own rotten core. So that was Scott Ritter. I just thought that was a hell of, hell of a thing. This is an interesting post. Uh, Russia is helping India. Russia is helping India save over $25 billion a year. In this thread, I'll cover everything you need to know. Uh, and I don't know if you'll cover it in here, but right now, uh, Russia is building a frigate for India. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I, I can't imagine that Russia building warships for India. <laughs> I mean, I, but you know, Russia builds good damn ships. But I think they're even better than the Chinese ships, although the Chinese do pretty good. So let's read his thread. One, how is Russia doing this? Due to Western sanctions, Russia has, forced, has been forced to sell their crude oil to other countries. Because there's less demand now, they're having to sell it for cheaper. India is now the largest buyer of Russian oil and is saving huge amounts, saving huge amounts of money by buying the cheaper Russian oil. But it doesn't stop here. Ooh, let's keep going. How does this help Russia? Russia obviously working to become a very, very strong allies with India, and as India is a global superpower. In fact, Russia has dramatically increased the amount of trade they've been doing with India over the last few months. So selling this oil to India for cheaper is another example of Russia trying to build a relationship with India. Let's get to his next thing. How much is India saving? Between March 2022 and March 2023, India spent $160 billion on crude oil which will be 160 trillion with hyperinflation. <laughs> Getting back to the earlier theme of the dollar going to zero. India then started buying Russian oil instead for cheaper. And between March 22, 2024, India just spent 130 billion on crude oil. And they didn't buy any less oil. They bought almost the exact same amount, but they saved $30 billion. So you can see in cheap oil, too bad the... Uh, Oh, by the way, that was another thing that came out in the Russian news. Holy shit, I forgot to talk about that. Uh, they found evidence that the United States and Great Britain blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. So now you have Seymour Hersh's paper that the evil Dem Biden administration, uncaring for the environment. That's another thing to talk about Democrats at the table. What about the environmental disaster that the Democrats created in, in the, uh, the ocean there by blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline? They're supposed to be environmentalists. They care about the environment, don't they? Yes, they care about the environment. Anyway, so, uh, but yeah, so the, the, the headline in the Russian newspaper, evidence that the terror, and they called them terrorist states, the terrorist states of the United, of the United, the terrorist United States and Great Britain blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Every Russian citizen now believes that. You think they aren't fired up for nuclear war? I don't know. I'm just saying. Some more info. I made a video covering this with some more information about this. Give it a watch. This is my own video from TikTok. So let's watch that video because I don't know what, uh, what the more info is. Let's watch that now. India has been buying Russian oil for the last year, but it turns out they've saved over $25 billion by doing this. Some context, obviously the West refused to buy Russian oil after they placed sanctions on Russia, and it meant that Russia had to sell their oil to other countries for cheaper. Now from March of 2022 to March of 2023 last year, India spent about $160 billion on crude oil to run their country. Now since that March 2023, India has been buying their crude oil from Russia. And between that March of 2023 to March of this year, India has spent only $130 billion on crude oil. Now, India bought roughly the same amount of oil. In fact, they only bought less than 1% less, but they saved over $25 billion because of Russia selling it for cheaper. Now, if you don't know, India is actually the largest buyer of Russian oil now, so the Western sanctions haven't really worked. And ironically, and quite weirdly, after the West placed the sanctions on 
onto Russia, they started buying oil from India, although it's the same Russian oil that they said they refused to buy. So the West continued to buy the same Russian oil, just for slightly more expensive and just via India this time. So they also made India more money. But regardless of that, a new report shows that India is now saving about $25 billion a year on oil over the Western sanctions on Russia. And you can leave me a follow for some more global news like this. All right, so that was that. And then, uh, okay, here's one more. For more global news like this, uh, which media very rarely covers, check out my page and then it's just going on. I am now full-time independent, blah, blah, blah. I say blah, blah, blah. I mean, he's doing some great reporting and you, you got his name. That's Alex uh, Brain, Brainicote. Uh, some of the stuff he reports on is kind of old news. Some of it I, I'm not sure is completely correct, so take it with a grain of salt, but he's, he does a good job. I mean, most everything, uh, I haven't seen him make any corrections, and that's when you know somebody's being truthful, like me. I always make corrections when, I, when there's something that, uh, this is uh, Ben Averbook. They've uncovered a new way to destroy companies. 30 tech founders were secretly debanked. No warning, no explanation, no appeals, pure silent government power. Let's watch that video. This started about 15 years ago with this thing called Operation Choke Point, where they decided to, um, as, as marijuana started to become legal, um, as prostitution started to become legal, and then guns, which there's always a fight about. Um, under the Obama administration, they started to debank legal marijuana businesses, prost escort businesses, and then and then and then gun shops, just like your gun manufacturers, and just like you're done, you're out of the banking system. And so, if you're running a medical marijuana dispensary in 2012, like you, guess what? You're doing your business all in cash. Because mm. you literally can't get a bank account, you can't get a visa terminal, you can't process transactions, you can't do payroll, you can't do direct deposit, you can't get insurance. Like none of that stuff is you've been sanctioned, right? None of that stuff is available. And then this administration extended that concept to apply it to tech founders, crypto founders, and then just generally political opponents. So, God. Yeah. So that's that's been like super pernicious. And, I wasn't aware of that. Oh, 100 percent. And this is called so it was Operation Short Point 1.0 was 15 years ago against the pot and the guns. Choke point 2.0 is primarily against their political enemies and then to their disfavored tech startups. And it's hit the tech world like we've hard. We've had like 30 founders debanked in the last four Real? years. Real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, been a, it's been a big recurring pattern. 30? Well, this is one of the reasons why we ended up supporting Trump. It's like we just can't, we can't live in this world. We can't live in a world where somebody starts a company that's a completely legal thing and then they literally like get sanctioned, right, and embargoed by the United States government through a completely unaccountable, no, by the way, no due process. None of this is written down. <laughs> there's no rules. There's no court. <laughs> there's no decision process. There's no appeal. Who do you appeal to, right? Like, who do you go to to get your bank account back? Yeah. The AI thing was very alarming. We had, we had meetings this spring that were the most alarming meetings I've ever been in, where they were taking us through their plans, and it was... Like no. What kind of... Can you talk about it? Basically, just full government, full government control, like this sort of thing. There, there will be a small number of large companies that will be completely regulated and controlled by the government. They, they told us, they told us, they just said, don't even start, don't even start startups, like, don't even bother. Like, there's just no way. There, there's no way that they can succeed. There's no way that we're going to permit that to happen. Wow. Yeah, they said, this is already over. It's going to be two or three companies, and we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to control them, and, and that's that. Like, this is already finished. Oh my God. Yeah. Now, now, when you leave a meeting like that, what do you do? You go endorse Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's that one. And now this is, this is the one I wanted to read to you because this was uh, in front of the, uh, the video on Beirut. And this was uh, the Canadian prepper. And I'm just going to read this to you because I thought he made a very good statement here. You're getting back to the Gaza theme. Boy, I tell you, I got fired up when they said only 45,000 people did. That's not a genocide. It's got to be in the millions. Yeah, it's, I told because there's, there's only 2.1 million people that live in Gaza. And I said, well, they're either going to be forced out or exterminated, and they're well on their way to exterminate them. Imagine going to a land, forcibly removing its indigenous pot people, and then when they resist, playing the victim while starving hundreds of thousands of them and bombing their densely populated neighborhoods. On top of that, secretly stockpiling nuclear weapons if you didn't know, Israel's got nuclear weapons. Boy, that would shock a Democrat, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, they seek, and by the way, it's against our, our policy. We're going to bomb Iran because they're developing nuclear weapons, but yet it's, it's okay for Israel to have nuclear weapons. Yeah, no problem. No problem. In violation of international treaties, engaging in cyber warfare, they do that in the United States. They have actually conducted cyber warfare within the United States. 
And oh, yeah, they're our ally. You know, we have no treaty with Israel. I want to point that out. I point that out constantly. We have no treaty with Israel. Israel will not come to our aid in a time of need. Okay? Yet we send billions to Israel. All right. <clears throat> Torturing prisoners and committing countless other war crimes. Yeah, they, there's all kinds of videos of them torturing the Palestinians. Raping them. My God. Holy moly. <clears throat> and when the international court hold you accountable, you dismiss its verdict. Yet somehow these people have the audacity to believe they are the righteous ones. Okay. Oh, this was the Zach. Uh, th this was a good one. Uh, Shall the button be pushed? We didn't deserve this planet. <laughs> He's being philosophical here. And uh, I, I do think the human race does deserve the planet Earth, but not by the way we're acting. And not with these evil people. I mean, there are evil people and that's that was the theme of the video in the beginning i wanted you to understand that a lot of democrats in, in, the, in the u.s government are evil all right they're not corrupt they're not bad they're evil all right sometimes i can't help but think we're the aliens here because it seems like we just don't belong nothing on this planet is ever good enough for us everything must be reshaped adjusted and made to fit our vision Natural forms replaced with sterile, 90 degree angles. I imagine God shaking his head and saying, if you don't like it here, maybe you should go back to wherever you came. And yet here we are watching as politicians downplay even the gravest threats of nuclear war, pushing us ever closer to the abyss. They seem fully aware this could be the end, but somehow they convince themselves they'll survive it all. Nobody survives global thermonuclear war. Well, I, I love that quote by Einstein. Third World War will be fought with nuclear weapons. The Fourth World War will be uh, sticks and pitchforks or sticks and knives or whatever, something like that, you know, because anyway, greed has devoured the last remnants of rationality in those who hold power. I mean, think of what, what these people in Washington, D.C., they're so greedy. It's unbelievable. I mean, when you've amassed, like Nancy Pelosi, 280 million and she's 80 some years old, why don't you just retire? Go be with your grandkids. If you had any semblance of, of, of you know, wanting to enjoy the world or anything, no, they're just into their power. They're evil, man. <coughs> and look at Mitch McConnell. I showed you his photo earlier. He's an evil son of a bitch, man. Greed has devoured the last remnants of rationality in those who hold power. Meanwhile, we are the spectators. Stand frozen as we edge closer to the most dangerous moment in history. Closer than we've ever been to nuclear catastrophe. And then he goes on about how he's lived his life. No, I want to continue to live my life that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that. And uh, so anyway, this, uh, we're, well, we're going to put that one up front. Oh, this is, uh, I want to show you this, this uh, meme. It's, it's, it's up there right now. This is how close Trump came <coughs> to dying. And did you hear the Democrat reporters on like CNN or MSDNC when they went on about Oh, it was a fake, you know, or, you know, it was, somebody took that shot and just nicked his ear or, or no, it, it was a, it was shrapnel flying off of the podium stand. I think this graphic shows everything you need to know. Um, so, and then of course, I want to talk about this because we're talking about the Trump administration. Trump is nom nominating neocon loons like Gorka and Rubio for a bait and switch scheme. This is his theories. Uh, this is to lull neocons into a false sense of security during the transition period after January 20th. He'll dump them for new picks. I wouldn't count on that. I wouldn't count on that. But I guess we'll, you know, Trump is stabbing his base in the back and has no friendships or, or no intentions of following through on campaign pledges. And that's my biggest concern. And Scott Ritter went on a tirade about how Trump is stabbing the American people in the back. If he's not seeking peace and if he's, he's going to listen to this Gorka loon, and, you know, say we're going to bomb, 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 bomb Iran, and we're going to send every weapon we got to Ukraine and continue the war and threaten Russia. Well, then Trump went back on all his campaign promises, and I can't support Trump no more. I'll have to, I'll, in fact, I'll be dissing Trump the way that I diss Biden the entire campaign. So, just saying. And then, uh, I, I like this one. This is real Ben. I killed Jesus Christ. I inventoried, uh, I invented usury. U-S-U-R-Y. You don't have to look that up. What is U-S-U-R-Y? I run the pornography industry. I am at the top of the most large corporations. I am heavily involved in big pharma. I, I can't be criticized without repercussions. I am exceptional at lying and victimhood. Who am I? Who do you think that is? <laughs> What's been the theme of the video? I won't say it out loud because somebody might come after me. And this was Max Blumenthal, and I wanted to read this to you. 
Uh, Sebastian Gorka served in a British intel unit and was mentioned by a UK military intel officer who has dedicated his career to war with Russia, even devising the blueprints for the KERCH bridge bombing. I don't know what that is. I, maybe I'll find out and do that in another video. Gorka is now set to advance the Biden policy on Ukraine within Trump's White House. And then uh, this is another post. I'll put the photo up. Is Sebastian Gorka a British asset? Gorka's British intelligence ties once cost him a uh, security clearance. His mentor is a UK spook now overseeing British covert operations against Russia. Is Trump's appointee operating on London time? Well, it's going to be a long video. Sorry about that. Uh, and then we did that one. Uh, we are on the verge of World War III. This is Jason Hinkle. Over the past 24 hours, the following occurred. Long-range missiles fired at Russia. Discussions sending nukes to Ukraine. Yeah, that's another thing I forgot to talk about was there are actual discussions of arming Ukraine with nuclear weapons. That's, a, that's nuclear war, baby. I mean, these people are lunatics, man. They're psychopaths. They're evil. Like, that's what I keep saying. NATO warned businesses to, uh, uh, to enter wartime scenario. NATO discussing preemptive bombings of Russia. UK and France discussing troop deployments to Ukraine. Germany has drawn up plans to use metro stations and air raid shelters. Okay, because and then I, uh, we already did the Mitch McConnell talk discussion in Walmart. Okay, we'll end it right there. I got some other posts, but we're too long. Peace out and stay free.